Good evening, I'm Harry Lehman. I've been a member of Embry Riddle's Board of Trustees since 19, since yeah, 89, that's a long time. To commemorate the 25th anniversary of our association with the university, my wife Ada and I decided to establish this distinguished speaker series. I met Dr. Robert Franklin in 1997 when he came to Atlanta to assume the presidency of the Interdenominational Theological Center, which is the Graduate Theological Center at the Atlanta University Consortium. Dr. Franklin graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Morehouse College in 1975 with a degree in political science and religion. He continued his education at the University of Chicago, earning a doctorate in ethics, society, religion, and the social sciences in 1985. He is a recipient of honorary degrees from Bethune Cookman University, Bates College, and Swarthmore College. Dr. Franklin has served on the faculties of the University of Chicago, Harvard Divinity School, and Emory University, where he was Presidential Distinguished Professor of Social Ethics from 2004 to 2007. In 2007, he became the 10th President of Morehouse College, which is the nation's largest private four-year liberal arts college for men. After five very successful years at Morehouse, he became a visiting scholar in residence at Stanford University. In 2014, he became the Laney Professor of Moral Leadership at Emory University in Atlanta, as well as the Director of Department of Religion for the Chautauqua Institution in Chautauqua, New York. Dr. Franklin is a member of the Salvation Army National Advisory Board, where he and I served together. He's a member of NASA's 100-year Starship Project Advisory Board, the Atlanta Rotary Club, the Council on Foreign Relations, and many others. He's married to Dr. Sh Goth Cheryl Gothman Franklin, an OBGYN physician in Atlanta. has three children, one grandchild. It is with a great deal of pleasure that I welcome Dr. Franklin to Henry Riddle. He will speak to us this evening on leadership for life. Dr. Franklin. and charismatic ambassador than one Mr. Harry Lehman. He is an extraordinary treasure to the metropolitan Atlanta community and indeed a national treasure. And I'd just like to personally thank you, Harry, for your long uh, friendship, for our collaborations on various and sundry projects in Atlanta and for the Salvation Army. And now I have to say that this is uh, my, my, my sense of humility has really reached peak as I serve this evening as the Harry and Ada Lehman Distinguished Speaker. It's a real pleasure to walk on this very impressive campus and to meet uh, President Johnson, the Distinguished Board, extraordinary faculty and staff, alumni, and the wonderful students. And there's a kind of energy on this campus that is inspiring and I really feel better about the next generation, about the future of our nation and the world in walking about this campus. So I'm really pleased to be here because I, as a former college president, think that institutions that form leaders are exceedingly important. And that's part of what's happening here on this wonderful campus. A strong culture producing strong leaders. And that's what I'd like to talk a bit about uh, this evening and at the conclusion of my remarks, there will be an opportunity for us to exchange uh, ideas. I'm interested in your thoughts, comments, and uh, questions that you might wish to raise. So I'd like to focus this evening on question, what is a good life and a just community? It's probably the most ancient of philosophical questions as we reflect this evening on the nature of a good life. In some sense, every one of us tonight is 
or organizing our priorities and investing our energies precisely in our conception of a good life, a better life. Many argue that uh, humans are wired to seek and enjoy meaningful relationships, family, friends, think of how important the concept of friendship was in ancient philosophical thought. In fact, the notion that a good society would be a place in which good friendships, uh, mutually enriching, enhancing friendships, would flourish. Certainly with neighbors, and I would stretch this notion even further beyond, that a good society is also seeking to connect strangers in meaningful ways. To live with purpose and to seek meaning. Now, these meaningful connections provide measurable, heightened pleasure and well-being in the brain. A number of psychologists and neuroscientists that are paying more attention to uh, the, the pleasure centers in the brain that are stimulated when we have meaningful interaction with friends, neighbors, and not simply family. But humans are not required or determined to do so is to experience meaningful relationships or to pursue uh, a good uh, life. Indeed, people can choose to live selfishly and live very bad. I know you don't have this on your campus, but in many campuses around the country, colleges, university boards and presidents are worried about a few people in their student bodies who are choosing to live and behave badly. You don't want to put me behind the uh, driver's seat of a plane out there, one of the assessments I'm really struggling. So I was struck as I looked at the website, this wonderful institution, the language that you put forth and the promises that Emory Riddle makes that uh, this is a place that fosters and where it's possible to establish lifelong connections. That really jumped out at me because I was thinking about the talk and thinking about the importance of meaningful connections to the good life. And uh, here, your, your website, put it front and center, that classmates today and industry leaders tomorrow, though Emory Riddle, Emory, Emory Riddle students come from all 50 states and 125 countries around the world, there's one trait they all share a determination to succeed, I like that notion of ambition, guided ambition. The bonds our students develop in the classrooms and residence halls last a lifetime. And our alumni association works to connect alumni with one another and with hundreds of employers around the globe. I'm always interested in the promises that institutions make. Some of you will work for and be attracted to employers. In some sense, they're making promises to you and you're responding to the value proposition and to the promises they offer. And I really admire the way in which you talk about that vision here. Well, one uh, graduate of Morehouse College, Martin King Jr., talked about the three dimensions of a complete life. And he spoke of the length of life, not, as, not in terms of longevity, but rather the extent to which we pursue and maximize our inner human potential. And so as you see this notion of the length of life as one of the important dimensions of a complete life, I invite you to think about potential, interests, uh, that you possess that you have not yet fully developed or cultivated. Indeed, one of the things that we have an opportunity to do in an institution of higher education is pursue uh, new interests and to deepen and sharpen our skill set to be effective, competent professionals. The length of life has to do with developing those inner powers, self-actualizing potential, and a healthy sense of self-love. One has to affirm oneself, believe in yourself, believe you can, uh, you can get up in the morning and make a difference in the world. And that is uh, healthy. That's not a more destructive or unproductive form of narcissism. The second dimension 
that uh, King speaks of is the breath of life. That is our outward concern for the welfare of others, in a sense what some psychologists call other regarding love. This moves us from kin altruism, that is being kind or generous only to the people who are in our families or extended families, but also to a broader sense of what is emerging in the field of ethics is known as bystander ethics. The sense that uh, people who are observing when situations in which they're not immediately impacted themselves become involved to produce better outcomes and results. That is acting in ways that help strangers, even if it entails a cost to oneself, as a mature expression of the good life, the moral life. In fact, King goes on to talk about how interdependence, our shared sense of connection and interdependence, is a fulfillment of the highest principles of moral life. In one of his essays, he has this wonderful, in fact, the essay is titled The World House. He uses a very striking image that I think we can all relate to. He says, when we awaken in the morning and we go into the bathroom and we reach for a bar of soap that was manufactured by a European, we go into the kitchen and we reach for coffee produced by a South American, or tea by a Chinese, or cocoa by a West African. He says, before we leave our homes for a classroom or the jobs in the morning, we are already beholden to more than half of the world. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. So that fundamental sense of interdependence is a key to a complete life. So King says, some people focus solely upon their own personal fulfillment, the length of life in this instance. But he challenges them to move beyond and also talk about and engage the breadth dimension where people are engaged meaningfully with others. But then he says we shouldn't stop there. We should also continue our quest for a complete life by engaging the dimension of height. And this is the human's upward, outward, and sometimes inward reach for the higher purpose. Some people utilize God language. Some utilize what the famous Paul, uh, theologian Paul Tillich characterized as an ultimate concern. Uh, so those who may be agnostic or atheist who don't utilize or believe in God can talk about an ultimate concern, principles of truth, or humanity, and its uh, survival, whatever that might be. Or other philosophers talk about a priori, or pre prior to any experience or empirical empirical reality, or abstract principles, prime, first mover, and so on. So there are a lot of ways in which one can uh, pursue this sense of a higher purpose, a higher calling, that my life is more than simply uh, the, the atoms that uh, swirl around in time and space, but the, the, the notion that I can pursue higher purposes and uh, experience a deeper sense of fulfillment is important to consider. So I'd like to suggest that uh, we have, as members of a university community, we can think of ourselves, each of us, as moral agents, certainly that potential. A moral agent defined as one who acts with integrity or acts in alignment with her or his most deeply held values, especially when tested. One writer, C.S. Lewis, said that Courage is not one of the, the virtues. Courage is the form of all the virtues at the point of testing. And so it's that notion that when we are tested, what manifests itself, what, what really comes forth? Acting with integrity, in alignment with our most deeply held values. Everyone has the capacity to be a moral agent, thanks to reason or the spark of the divine, or however you choose to talk about that capacity to act for what is good and right in the world. So I want to invite you to just take a moment and to score yourself for the past 12 months, having, what, having encountered this notion of the three dimensions of a complete life, the length of life, 
Not simply how long we live, but the extent to which we maximize our inner potential, cognitive character and elsewhere, otherwise. The breadth of life, how, how broadly do we reach out to engage beyond, as I said, kin altruism, our own families, but to neighbors, to friends, and even to strangers. And then this wonderful sense of uh, pursuing higher, higher calling, higher purposes, art, poetry, philosophy. Harry Lehman likes to talk about the importance of the liberal arts as a, uh, as a, a balancing uh, conversation partner with the STEM disciplines, and I think it's very important. How are you doing on the three dimensions of life? And then think about an example in which you have served, had an opportunity to function as a moral agent, acting in alignment with your deeply held values, even when they're put to the test. But then I want to move the conversation forward so that we talk not only about moral agents who act with integrity, but also moral leaders. And this is the challenge I placed before uh, the students and faculty and staff, and indeed all the stakeholders of Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, to become moral leaders, to be men, women and men who act with integrity and imagination to serve the common good, serve the common good, while inspiring others to join them. This is an important role of leaders to enlist and invite uh, people to be a part of a more noble project. And so you recognize this wonderful image of one of the great sculpt sculptors of our nation, Mount Rushmore, constructed in the mid-1920s. And uh, it be a nice test. Some who may not recognize all those faces you certainly recognize George Washington, and Thomas Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln. And a little bit of trivia, some of you will know that uh, initially Jefferson, who appears on the left shoulder, was started on the right, and uh, it, it, the rocks weren't cooperating. Things weren't going right. So they had to blast away the face that uh, incomplete there and move it to the left shoulder. So. But again, I think one of the ways in which we have tried to uh, symbolize our celebration of leaders, not saints, moral leaders in the political, business, educational, and other realms, people who are acting with integrity and imagination to serve the common good while inspiring others to join them. So let's take a look at uh, the more extended version of a Mount Rushmore, if you will. And I'd like to invite you to think about how you feel about some of these people. Because uh, while some of these are perhaps uh, uncontroversial as uh, moral leaders, using my definition, women and men, acting with integrity and imagination to serve the common good, may not be perfect individuals, but you see the larger purpose and agenda of their lives. So, of course, Nelson Mandela, Malala Yousafzai, a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize last year, Pope Francis, Mahatma Gandhi, Mother Teresa, the California labor leader, Cesar Chavez. Many don't recognize Dorothy uh, Day, an important uh, worker and leader in the Catholic labor movement. Martin Luther King, Aung San Suu Kyi of, of Burma, elected official in prison under house arrest, a daughter of a popular uh, former president, prime minister. Rather. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama, in the middle at the top, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German Lutheran pastor who was arrested, ultimately executed, for participating in a plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. Now, students today in graduate schools uh, pay a lot of attention to Bonhoeffer because precisely the kind of courage that he, uh, he manifests, even as a person committed to, to peace and to the radical love ethic of uh, Jesus of Nazareth. Face also here this often not recognized Ella Baker, she was an extraordinary uh, woman who worked with 
college students. That was her passion. And Ms. Baker there in North Carolina helped to organize and facilitate the organization of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee during the 1960s. When others felt that young students, high school and college students should join uh, adult movements, as it were, she insisted, no, let students have their own movements. And she was one of the few women who could stand up to people with powerful personalities like uh, Martin Luther King said, no, the kids will have their own movement. You do what you need to do. Let them do what they have to do. Uh, some students chuckle when they see uh, Bob Marley, a uh, popular uh, reggae artist, uh, Jamaican. But uh, we, I saw him do something extraordinary at a time of uh, political division, real polarization and crisis. Uh, leaders of the uh, opposition, opposing parties who wouldn't even speak to each other. And he held a concert on the, essentially, the Jamaican Independence Day. So people came together in celebration of their nation. And he saw both candidates present for this concert in the, uh, in the audience and invited them up and made them hold hands while they sang his wonderful reggae classic, One Love. It's a powerful, transformative moment for a lot of people. And it's all what was possible when leaders who look across the uh, political spectrum respect one another and have a conversation. Of course, Bobby Kennedy, one of the extraordinary moments in his life of becoming, I think, a moral leader as he observed uh, wretched poverty in Mississippi and came to a, an appreciation and a recognition that there were parts, uh, even in our wonderful country, uh, that, the, that the American dream hadn't yet been manifest, and he devoted himself in the closing years of his life to making a difference there. Uh, some of you drink an awful lot of Starbucks. I passed the uh, Starbucks on campus earlier today. Um, Dean Glenn wouldn't allow me to stop. We were rushing him forward, but I was impressed. I'm just teasing Dean. I'm so grateful for the uh, hospitality here. But what impresses me about Howard Schultz, uh, CEO of, of Starbucks, is a commitment to his employees and efforts to sort of break the silence on difficult social issues. Doesn't always get it right, but there's a Again, and, and, and the commitment to acting with integrity and imagination uh, to serve the common good. And of course, leaders have to be humble enough to revise, constantly revise as they encounter challenges and as they engage in dialogue that helps them to grow. Gloria Steinem, founder of Ms. Ma Ms. Magazine, many recognize as the founder, uh, leading voice of the feminist movement, as we tonight, she is walking from South Korea to North Korea, plans if she is able to cross the, the DMZ uh, there, so that's going to be extraordinary. But once again, uh, not accepting the kind of frozen and polarized tensions between North and South Korea, determined to open new kinds of conversations, who knows where that will go, that's one of the challenges of being an innovator a thought leader, someone who pushes the boundaries. You don't know how it turns out always, but you're willing to take responsible risk. Uh, some, will, you know, love him or hate him, I'm Michael Moore, a filmmaker, uh, challenging us to have difficult conversations, to hold uh, our leaders uh, uh, accountable, and of course he's a, as mischievous as they come as he seeks to do that in his art. Harvey Milk, one of the early uh, openly gay leaders, San Francisco uh, supervisor, and again, one who was attempting to broaden our understanding of what it meant to be a diverse, inclusive nation. Marion Wright Edelman, founder and president of the Children's Defense Fund, a nonprofit based in Washington, D.C., uh, Yale Law School, uh, educated woman who actually guided Bobby Kennedy through the Mississippi Delta as he was uh, engaged in those tours and preparing to, uh, to run for president. The two bills, I keep them together. Again, these are folks who can you know, love them or hate them. They make us think. They challenge our assumptions. And they break the silence on taboo topics, break the silence on uh, uh, unexamined assumptions. And so we have a comedian and a, and a television journalist and, and commentator. Jimmy Carter, uh, 
Many argue that he's far more uh, effective voice post-presidency than he was as a president. But again, trying to call attention to the presence of violence in many religious traditions, um, trying to uh, help the world appreciate the challenges that women in particular face and experiencing opportunities to uh, learn in various parts of the world. And so, Elie Wiesel, a um, Holocaust survivor, Nobel Peace Prize uh, recipient, and an extraordinary uh, soul. Kim De Jong, one of the <coughs> former presidents of uh, South Korea, and one who was uh, uh, recognized by many as the kind of Nelson Mandela of South Korea. Uh, all these figures carry a certain measure of controversy, but he was also uh, trying to push the conversation about the need to transition from military dictatorships to democracies. And democracies are messy, messy parties, messy affairs, and yet we have to, uh, to pursue and endure. Uh, I wanted someone from Hollywood, and you know, this it, is again kind of a gray zone. So, Sondra Rhimes is very popular uh, these days with a number of popular television shows. Um, and one might argue that she actually opens conversations about what ought to be precisely by looking at most negative representations of, of what it is. So, uh, you know, romance and suspense in the Beltway. Uh, in, the, uh, in the hit uh, program Scandal and, and in other work she's been engaged in. Ellen Sirley Johnson is an uh, extraordinary uh, president, current president of the West African country of Liberia and an important uh, voice, first woman to be elected president of an African country. But also, three months ago, she penned a letter to the, to the global community regarding uh, the need for massive international mobilization to help Liberia respond to the plague of, of uh, Ebola. And uh, she challenged people, educated people, and did something I think exceedingly important. And then uh, I, I wanted to uh, add a, a sci scientist, uh, Albert Schweitzer, really something of a, uh, a, a renaissance man. Uh, so, of course, worked in, in science, but also uh, in, in, was a writer, uh, played music, wrote music, and did an extraordinary number of things as a, uh, as a balanced figure. So Schweitzer certainly challenges us to think beyond our usual narrow professional boundaries and identities. So that we can say that the purpose of education, both cognitive, and character excellence. Aristotle suggested that there are three dimensions of becoming a moral leader, a person of significance and change in the world that ought to be attended to. One is knowledge, knowledge of what is true, right, good, beautiful, knowledge of what is praiseworthy. And we can teach much of that. How often do we engage students in conversations about what is uh, in the best interest of the whole? What's in, what, what, serves, what best serves the common good? So moral knowledge, Aristotle says, is important to transmit to young people. And one of my worries is that there are a lot of young folks growing up in our society today who are not being uh, socialized into a a, 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 a framework that emphasizes what is right and good and true and beautiful. And so when parents are not doing that, when school systems are not doing that, I would argue it's the responsibility of all uh, morally serious adults, all of us, to step up and attempt to address that challenge. Again, using uh, imaginative ways of uh, advancing that conversation. But knowledge of what's right and good is, is not sufficient. Aristotle also says it's important to talk about will, or desire, as he uses that language in some of his writing. That is cultivating a healthy ambition and desire to do what is right and good. 
This is how moral leaders should be motivated and disposed to act and not simply reflect on what is good and right or opine about it. It is the commitment to acting, to moving from an observer to the bystander who intervenes, uh, who speaks up for truth, for peacemaking, for forgiveness, for uh, breaking down uh, walls of, uh, of, of prejudice and, and ignorance. Knowledge, knowledge of what is good, the will and desire to do good, but then he says we also have to practice doing good. Practice acting, and I'm using here some Hebrew Bible language, acting justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly with uh, one's God. That sense that uh, we practice, we fail, but through trial and error, we become better at uh, embodying the noble ideals to which we are committed. I would argue we need leaders who educate and inspire us to reach that which is seemingly impossible. Think about what it was like in the early years as this republic was coming together. The need for leaders of integrity and imagination they were not perfect. They were not saints. They were committed to a project of transforming this nascent country into one of the great nations of the world. And many argue that societies either thrive, pardon that typo, societies, plural, thrive or lag based on the quality of leadership. I love uh, Historian Joseph Ellis has written the Founding Brothers, this wonderful portrait of the extraordinary leaders and personalities, amazing intellects at the founding of our nation. And we have the capacity to continue that, not simply in terms of our government, but also in business, in education, in uh, other fields of endeavor. And let me suggest that particularly on a campus like this one, that uh, there are thought leaders who lead with integrity and imagination. And uh, in James's book, it's just one uh, effort to highlight 51 remarkable engineers, as he calls them, from the 17th century to the 21st uh, century. I hope there's some remarkable engineers in this audience tonight. Warren Bennis, the former <coughs> president of the University of California system, talks about competencies of successful leaders. And back to this theme of success in the Henry Riddle uh, mission statement. They master the context, understand the environment, the people around you, uh, the uh, economic, political, social, cultural dynamics. Master the con context. Secondly, effective leaders know themselves. They spend time thinking about the, the, the internal blueprints and the role models and the internal tapes we play in our heads as we, as, we, as we sort of envision scenarios, what we need to do in the world and the possibilities uh, for making a difference. We also know our strengths as well as our shortcomings and are willing to be honest. I heard uh, uh, someone in our, our midst at lunch today talk about, I at least admit when I'm wrong. In fact, I think it was, it was our, our President Johnson. And, 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 and I think that there's something inspiring about that in leaders who are willing to acknowledge, well, I mean, we, we, this is what we were aiming for, didn't quite get it right, but let's, let's aim again, let's try again. And it's that sense that uh, we rely on the strength of our team. It's important to have good teams teams that bring a variety of perspectives uh, to bear upon every decision and uh, project we engage. They also create visions. Leaders have vision, a picture of possibility, unrealized possibility, where we might go together if we were to take seriously our, our potential and what this uh, enterprise can become. 
they communicate those visions with, uh, with meaning. And so communication is an exceedingly important part of having an effective vision. They build trust through integrity. Indeed, it is over time, and back to Aristotle, that as knowledge, will, or the desire to do what's right and good, and practice, as those come together over time, they form, they produce habits. People can sort of predict that you will uh, show up in a certain kind of way because you've established this, that you're the person who's uh, going to speak up uh, for the least advantaged members of the uh, community or campus. You're going to uh, take the lead uh, and speak up for sustainability or the fragility of our environment. You're the person, and those habits come to define who you are. And, of course, some people are perpetually committed to uh, non-engagement, not getting involved, not speaking up, and that, too, becomes a habit and a way of defining a certain character. But Aristotle says, over time, that practice, the knowledge, the will, practice, shape habits, and over time, habits form character. Habits become our character. So we build trust with people as we deliver uh, on our word. We're people who speak the truth, we keep our promises, we do what is right to maintain a uh, civil community and society. And then we realize our intentions through uh, action and not simply words. People are watching us and not simply listening for the things that we have to say. This is another uh, wonderful quote that I've appreciated over the years from from Martin King that this hour in history needs a dedicated circle of what he calls transformed nonconformists. Saving our world from pending doom will come not from the adjustment of a conforming majority, but from the creative maladjustment. Isn't that a wonderful phrase? How many of you have ever been in groups where you thought, I'm not I'm out of sync with the other folks in this group, in this organization, in this classroom as that sense of creative maladjustment that I think should be embraced and claimed because that may be the seed, the germ that leads to some breakthrough paradigm, some new idea, some new approach uh, to solving old human problems in an innovative way from the creative maladjustment of a transformed minority. And so we Occupy a campus where innovation, experimentation, and uh, where ideas and people take flight, uh, literally and figuratively. And I'm so impressed with the opportunity for uh, Emory Riddle to help the United States of America and the global community uh, cultivate leaders for life, women and men who integrate the length, the breadth, and the height of life in meaningful ways, who act with integrity and imagination to serve the common good, and who themselves seek to be Renaissance men and women, who balance uh, their commitment to intellectual and cognitive excellence with character excellence as well, a commitment to listen to others, to include others, and to serve, to give back, uh, to, to, to uh, invest in the next generation and a better world. And so I conclude with a wonderful observation by Rabbi Maimonides, a medieval thinker, who said, the world is equally balanced between good and evil, and your next act will tip the scale. Thank you for listening. But what does this stir in you? What are you thinking now? What, what, where do we push back? Uh, what am I missing? What do we need to add to this analysis? Uh, or what new learning, new ideas emerge for you? So there are microphones here, and they can, I think, uh, 
become roving microphones. If you'd like to raise a question. Yes, here. In transients between our political parties in this country, whether they're good leaders, they're leaders on both sides of, of the fight uh, to make their way understood, but we've got such a breach in our government in Washington that our leadership seems to be masked by people who are just unwilling to compromise and unwilling to discuss on both sides. How do we get through that, that breach? Well, I suspect that part of the answer is, uh, is there embedded in your, in, your, in your framing of the question, how do we get through? And I think part of it is we, we have to get through this difficult period, through this difficult time. I suspect that leaders who are, who are dug in in uh, the righteousness of their respective positions are not likely to experience conversions. They're not likely to change. I regret that. I wish they would. But I'm not expecting that from Capitol Hill. I don't know if you are. What I am hoping for is precisely the focus of the talk, that there will be soon emerge after the frustration, the futility of the fragmented politics that polarizes our great country. My hope is that someone will say, gee, I've got to make a break with the status quo because it is dysfunctional. And perhaps a, a, a single or a couple of leaders and then a coalition emerges around them and soon uh, a, a, a different kind of voice can emerge. So we, you know, we've seen that. And whenever I feel most despairing about what happens, especially since you mentioned uh, Capitol Hill, I do uh, reflect that you know there wasn't a nation more torn and divided than uh, than, than South Africa in the, in the late '80s, and the tensions and the sense that there would never be change, and yet from this environment emerges, you know, there's there's there's. Frederick Leclerc and Nelson Mandela sitting talking to each other. And it's a, in, in a, a breakthrough that one couldn't have programmed, couldn't have required, and yet these things do occur in history. And so that's what I'm sort of pulling for and trying to encourage and nurture the conditions under which that can happen. Uh, affirming those voices who are calling for that is, is important as just as ordinary uh, citizens. Uh, we can do that. We can say to those leaders who are trying to, I mean, I think of uh, someone you and I know well, uh, former Senator Sam Nunn. Uh, but there are other voices on the Hill now who are trying to call for that kind of uh, common ground and affirmation for the good of the nation. So there may not be significant dramatic breakthroughs, but small voices of sanity and reason and openness to uh, compromise and reconciliation can emerge. And I hope that that will, uh, will happen in our time. Thank you. Other comments or questions or suggestions? Yes. From, well, I guess we should ask you to wait for the money. Is there anything that higher education can do mm -hmm. to bridge this gap, this divide that exists in the politics, uh, it, whether it's in the curriculum or mm -hmm. extracurriculum, anything that you can suggest? I think it's always uh, useful <clears throat> because higher education is this wonderful zone in a democratic society where people kind of have a blue sky. We can we can experiment, we can think together about unrealized possibilities. Recall George Bernard Shaw's wonderful quote, you know, some men, and he used, I'll change that to more inclusive, some people see things as they are and ask why, but others dream things that never were and ask why not? And so I think we are, especially as faculty and deans and leaders of, in a higher education, environment have these dreamers in, on our campuses, in our midst, and we should really work, continue to help launch them well uh, to enable 
uh, their leadership because they're going to be here for the long haul, have the energy and creativity, can make important things happen. I think institutions that can uh, also undertake or sponsor research. Uh, I'm, I'm excited by some of the global collaborations in, um, in, 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 in the STEM domain, for instance, that I think are terrific and bring nations that may not be working very well together in the political arena. Uh, they, they sort of get along around problem solving, inventing the next generation of you know, eco car that so that uh, Henry Riddle is uh, involved in one of those competitions, or uh, next generation of telecommunications or clean uh, energy or whatever it might be. So, you know, highlighting possibilities of collaboration in teams uh, that, are, that are global and diverse, I think, is, is also hopeful. I think we should challenge. Uh, student organizations to, to, to be more innovative, to take more risks, uh, to manifest and symbolize uh, diverse voices and perspectives, finding a way to have civil conversations uh, and, and, and reflecting values of uh, respect and openness and tolerance. And so, so I think it's, it's important for us to model that uh, and certainly to encourage and sponsor these opportunities for others. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, in an earlier time, President of Harvard University, Derek Bach, people like that would, would really challenge the larger society uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, to, do, to do better for the good of the next generation. And if that meant uh, subsuming their uh, political agendas, Harry and I would teasing about this word earlier. We have a friend who, say, overuses the term, shall we say. And, uh, but, but subsuming their agendas and priorities to the larger good, the common good, and practicing that, like Aristotle's notion, and knowing how to do that, to having a desire to do it, and then practicing it, could make uh, an enormous difference. President. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Franklin. First of all, we just want to uh, extend our appreciation for your coming to Edward Riddle and uh, sharing your uh, uh, meaningful thoughts uh, with us. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the concerns that uh, I have is uh, the role of the media in terms of serving as a model uh, for people in, in our country in terms of their behavior, because it, it seems like to me that while they can shape and, and represent the world in a good light, that the things they tend to focus on are people acting badly. And it seems that that's what's newsworthy nowadays. Uh, so we don't have enough stories that are positive uh, where we show civility and where we show kindness and uh, where we show people acting in good uh, ways that where, they're, where they're not being selfish, but where they're giving to others. And so, you know, is part of our problem the fact that we have, we have instant communications, uh, we have um, you know the internet, and we have all the social media, but then we also have the national media that are televising bad things, bad behavior that seems to get attention. Uh, what what can you comment on that, sir? Well, you know, and I have uh, perhaps uh, contributed to the problem by highlighting at least a couple of figures in my little Mount Rushmore who I think occasionally cross the line and, and uh, are, are provocative, but who are also, who also reflect, uh, at least at times, a kind of reasonableness and an openness to uh, authentic dialogue. I mean, dialogue in which you know, one's mind can actually be changed. That, that's the real definition of, of real dialogue. And so there's an open mind, there's an active mind at work there. And I admire that, whether I happen to agree uh, with, with the particular uh, economic or political agenda or not. Uh, I, I, I think that the media can do uh, more, but I think that we've also now been, we've become conditioned to a certain media diet, intellectual content, that is uh, polarizing, bombastic, sensational, and um, 
uh, often overly materialistic and, 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 and self-centered that is, uh, I think, ultimately harmful, harmful to us. One challenge I hear, because I mean, anybody who listens to the C-SPAN or you hear thoughtful pundits weigh in on these questions, well, we need to offer more counterexamples, examples of a positive uh, model. But uh, people quickly counter, those don't sell as well. They, they, they just don't get the same kind of attention. So I think that's a challenge for us to puzzle out. How can we make uh, the examples of people, uh, politicians, business leaders, religious leaders, especially in the realm of uh, religion now, where it's become such a, uh, not simply polarizing, but in many respects deadly, uh, force in society, and yet we all know that religion has been and can be and must continue and in the future be a force for positive uh, change, for helping us solve our deepest problems. Uh, I know that Dr. Uh, David Keck and others are committed to that and infusing that perspective into the larger uh, campus conversation. So I think we just have to sort of plow away in a quiet, steady, faithful fashion to say we know that this is right and we will continue to practice and do what is right and good. Listen, be open-minded, be forgiving, be patient with one another. Uh, those are not the sexiest of virtues, but I think we have to just hold, it, hold, hold, the, uh, uh, hold it our ground on those. And then, as I say, challenge and reward people for making uh, experimental steps to, to get it right. But I, I do think we need younger people, creative people who are operating precisely what you ha highlighted in terms of social media and a universe that you know my older brain is still trying to wrap itself around. Uh, they they you know they can frame that Instagram post that says uh, that says something important to this generation that I may not be able to fall asleep on this, but the, the, the joy and excitement I have is that there are younger people, there are students here, who can take the kind of fundamental virtues and values we are talking about, and I trust most of us share, and package and communicate those in innovative ways. So I'm hopeful, although I don't have great answers right now about where that change will come from Winston. So you mentioned in your presentation, you talked a lot about people that have made an impact. And you know, just when you think you have a knack on leadership is when you've learned something new. And, and I thank you for you know, coming here. And you, you, you put another aspect to things that I seem to have learned over my short time in the riddle. And what I have seen is that you know, history repeats itself, whether it's in an organization or in society. You know, things seem to repeat themselves. So, is there is there such a thing as a perfect model for you know uh, you know an organization or society, or is it always dependent on someone who stands out? Is it always dependent on a leader and someone that can motivate people? Yeah, it's an interesting uh, question. I, I don't think it uh, always depends upon an, a, a single leader or an innovator or even. <coughs> Margaret Mead, the great anthropologist, talked about uh, never doubting the power of a small group of well-organized, passionate individuals to change the world. She so said, in fact, it's the only thing that ever has. And so I think that the, uh, pre precisely our sociality, that is our commitment to operating in groups, usually smaller groups, but uh, having a, a set of conversation partners who can challenge us to think more clearly and then on occasion to act in ways that are important to the larger world. We want to call attention to something that people uh, are missing. Uh, it may start with a few people in positions for social responsibility. Uh, it may be, you know, Greenpeace uh, boarding a ship. There aren't a lot of people there, but they go out and say, look, you have to stop killing uh, whales or sharks. And we're just going to show up and get in the way and, and say no. So this notion of those who are resisting uh, uh, injustice or 
harming um, <clears throat> endangered species. We see this happening with elephants and, and all sorts of campaigns where a relatively small number of people who feel uh, passionate and committed about an issue began to simply act. And over time, um, attention is paid to them. So, so you're right, it's not just that extraordinary individual, our Mount Rushmore figures, but sometimes small and even larger organizations or groups committed to certain uh, visions and, and causes can, can advance uh, uh, our democracy in, 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 in important ways. There is a wonderful study produced by Booz Allen on the world's most enduring institutions. And I, I, as you raise that question, I think about it, or you, you know, Google that study, the world's most endure, enduring institutions. What they did was they interviewed or surveyed 300 uh, professionals from various sectors, from science and humanities and, and business, and asked them, what are the qualities that distinguish the organizations and institutions that you regard as enduring and, and, and important? And it was fascinating that a list of six or seven qualities emerged. Uh, innovation, adaptability, they all possess a risk management uh, culture. Uh, information flows throughout the organization and not simply limited to a few people. And then they were asked, and now name two organizations from your field that you regard as the endure, most enduring and manifesting, embodying these, uh, these values like innovation and adaptability and legitimacy and so on. And it was a fascinating list. You'll enjoy looking at it because uh, they talk about uh, the Salvation Army as one. Uh, Oxford University, uh, the modern Olymp Olympic Games, <clears throat> the U.S. Constitution, and then they conclude with the Rolling Stones, the rock group. <laughs> and so the world's most enduring institutions reflect certain common qualities, core qualities, and perhaps uh, leaders of organizations can pay more attention to uh, almost a kind of periodic checklist, a report card of how are we doing uh, in these areas. Is that responsive to you? Did you have a question? You go first. <laughs> we have a moment here, but I'm going first. I always wish I'd gone first, but I hardly know how to express what I'm trying to say here. Emory Riddle, in its old days, and I go way back to the early 60s with Emory Riddle, succeeded, even though it was borderline broke for, for its first decade, I reckon, and maybe longer, and struggling, struggling constantly and financially, it succeeded uh, only, I mean, primarily, I'd always say only, because of the commitment, but no, I can't say only, as to the student body because of the commitment of the students to a passion for aviation, which is, uh, you might be passionate about tennis, you might be passionate about chess, you might be passionate about whatever, but our student body was passionate about aviation. And so they came here, they didn't all succeed, of course, but aviation then, of course, meant fly, fly, primarily flying airplanes in inner space, not outer space. As things have progressed, fortunately, for our university, uh, that passion has extended as those boundaries have extended. And so we have a, an astronaut that's sitting here with us because that passion has gotten beyond the atmosphere. Necessarily, uh, however, becoming less focused on a single thing and, and involving many more technical things that go in a variety of directions, more or less uh, synchronized and more or less not synchronized. But, but that was the focus. And that's what has made this university su succeed, in my opinion, along with the other part, which is the faculty that could, could uh, provide what that passion uh, among the students needed. And, and uh, 
that, that's quite a challenge and I'm really impressed with how they continue to rise to the level because it gets harder and harder when you're getting out farther and farther reaches from getting in an airplane and pulling the prop and, mm -hmm. and, and smelling the fumes and, and, and pulling on the stick and whatever. So it gets harder and harder, but that passion seems to have persisted. However, that doesn't have much to do realistically with what you've been talking about. And yet, uh, as I hear you, uh, I think you're saying that this, what you're talking about is also very important. And I know you said a few minutes ago, I don't have the answers. So I'm not asking you to give us a prescription, but I, I would be interested in your comment on how does a, a university bring into its uh, message that it wants to deliver to its students of, uh, of a mission in life that includes the, that basic passion that they have for aviation or aeronautics and, and outer space and so forth, but broadens their perspective into this, uh, uh, it's almost religious, it doesn't have to be religious, but it's uh, giving a broader purpose in their lives that continues to motivate them. Uh, I'd, I'd like to hear your comments on that if my question is sufficiently framed for you to do so. Well, I, I'm inspired and, and challenged by the question of how you maintain uh, a rigorous uh, commitment to quality as you diversify, expand, and uh, really seem to be responsive to both market opportunities and just to the new ideas that, and uh, activities in the world. And I think that uh, the little I know of uh, this university, you, you are doing it well. And uh, you're holding yourselves accountable to the, to the, to the issue of how do we engage in ongoing uh, institutional assessment and uh, fidelity to our original mission while adapting uh, to the 21st century, insisting on high quality uh, and standards, uh, <clears throat> but also being willing to, to, to experiment a bit. So, Again, I, I, I just sense that in the things I've read, the people I've talked to and visiting with the president. Uh, I think it's also important to constantly expose uh, students to uh, uh, other perspectives, to the broadening, uh, to narrow science, for narrow uh, science and engineering, um, uh, to, to be challenged and recontextualize in this broader world think, have you considered, have you thought about? Do you think about the, your particular narrow, narrowly focused uh, major or subject matter of passion in relation to a larger world? What are the consequences of your activity when done well or when done poorly uh, on the larger uh, social good? So I think you know some of this faculty have a responsibility and certainly have an opportunity to challenge students, place this particular in a larger context, and let's hear how you think through that. Uh, and to expose them to reading, I think reading is an important opportunity, certainly through other multimedia uh, inputs, and even if I might uh, uh, be <coughs> uh, not self-serving in saying that with, with Harry and Ada, uh, layman distinguished speakers and the presidential speaker uh, series, bringing uh, thought leaders in who, who do offer different perspectives, I think is really, really valuable. So to cultivate that capacity, not to be off balance when you encounter a new paradigm or a different way of seeing it, but to figure out how do I engage, relate to, uh, integrate this, or, or, or redefine its value for me, I think is, is an important intellectual project. Um, and of course, I know, you know the board is going to hold everyone accountable to, are we remaining true to that mission? And are we the best we can possibly be? I think that's... Well, thank you for that response, and thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, my question um, relates to uh, this whole idea of an enduring organization. Um, 
enduring uh, institutions. And when I think about uh, our fine university here and, and, and uh, the idea that we're developing uh, the next generation of leaders and people that are being trained here uh, uh, and worldwide on our campuses to assume that, that, that next role. Um, what concerns me is, is, the, is the whole notion of leadership. Um, in my experience, the leadership development actually is taken on by those institutions they join. And when they're fortunate to join the military organization, there's a very advanced understanding of leadership. Um, however, um, the enduring uh, organizations and corporations that, that I'm most familiar with have a common thing, and that is that they have very strong understanding of leadership, and, they, and they're able to articulate the values and the principles of leadership as opposed to the skills of managing, which are two very different worlds. Um, so I guess the challenge I, that, that I have in my mind is what role um, does the institutions of higher learning uh, really have? What, what, what responsibility do they have for teaching values-based leadership and really beginning to give a full um, uh, sense of development or full sense of understanding among the students coming through these institutions um, about what leadership is. Whether they, whether they go into business or whether they go into other fields, it doesn't really matter to me. Leadership is leadership. And I, and I don't think we do a good job at the, at the academic level in developing those leaders with actual specific training. So I, I'd like your thoughts on that. Well, I find this very, very intriguing and, uh, and insightful in terms of the challenges we face and throughout the society, frankly, uh, precisely in this area. There are, as you highlighted, certain organizations, sectors of society, like the military, um, like some of our uh, uh, you know, training venues for, for managers and some who want to be great leaders, some simply function as, as managers. Uh, but we need to do a better job of, um, of, of challenging people to, to, to develop what I think begins with a kind of intellectual uh, stimulation, uh, challenge, uh, inviting people to dream beyond what currently exists and not simply to focus on the, the management of the now and the status quo. I think in our, our, our value and mission statements, I think this notion of the tone at the top gets set by inviting students to think of themselves as, as leaders in their disciplines and fields, but also in, in society. Uh, people who are committed to engaging or practicing their particular profession in a way that does produce certain goods in the world, that's, that's, that's pretty terrific. And we ought to be, we ought to own that and talk about that and inspire others to think about the good they do uh, as, a, as a form of leadership and is inviting others to join them as they seek to improve our world and improve human existence. But um, yeah, there, there, that's another one where I think we are, we are not doing well as a society. And I think this conversation has been going on in uh, certainly in, in business schools and other places when I uh, heard one study suggesting that among the elite business schools, you know, two thirds of the students were uh, you know, admitted they were willing to, uh, to cheat or to bend the rules in order to improve the bottom line and sort of stun the faculty. They said, gee, uh, there's a learning agenda we're not covering if you know, the majority of students in my classroom are thinking this way, or this sort of situational ethics. We have to respond not simply to producing brilliant minds, but kind of talking about whole people who live in a world where they are interdependent and the breadth of life is taken seriously. So I think it's a time for recalibration of the conversation about leadership uh, in, in the nation. Um, it's no surprise that the military, because they, they really developed science and art of this, uh, do well and, and send to our 
democracy extraordinary uh, leaders, and, and you know, one thinks of um, people like Colin Powell and others who have been inspired and challenged a lot of us to be better people, better citizens. Uh, but it comes out of a strong culture of service and discipline. And so I think we have to, um, to, to at least start with articulating how important this is, again, exposing students to uh, readings and pieces that, 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 that invite them to grow, to grapple with this. Students should be reading uh, Emerson and others, uh, developing a voice of reason and of conscience, even in, in you know, a field that is exceedingly esoteric, um, to ask, how does this relate to the larger whole and the connections? Um, the Dalai Lama is at Emory University asking a question about neuroscience and meditation and Buddhist practices of mindfulness. Uh, again, kind of exploring connections that haven't been made. And I think again, that's our intellectual responsibility. Where are the connections we haven't yet forged and explored around the question of how do we produce better leaders? So I will think about this a, a long time after tonight. Thank you for raising it. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Franklin.